Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining our second breakout session and the final event for today's virtual summit. As you all know, the coronavirus has disrupted academic life in previously unimaginable ways. Last semester, campuses were closed, events were canceled, students were sent home, classes were conducted online. And administrators are still facing this tough decision of whether to reopen campuses in the fall and under what conditions. All of this has imposed enormous financial burdens on colleges and universities. Financially strapped institutions have shut down and even economically stable universities have implemented salary and hiring freezes and have put capital projects on hold. What does all of this mean for the future of American colleges and universities and what reforms might these pressures inspire? We're for fortunate to have three wonderful panelists with us to discuss these issues. Naomi Schaefer Riley is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, where she focuses on child welfare and foster care issues, but also writes often about higher education, including most recently for National Affairs and the Washington Examiner. She's also the author of The Faculty Lounges and Other Reasons Why You Won't Get the College Education You Pay For. I should have uh, offered everybody a trigger warning before uh, mentioning the title of that book. A graduate of Harvard, Naomi is a frequent contributor to a variety of publications, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Robert Kelchin is Associate Professor of Higher Education and Co-Chair of the Department of Education, Leadership Management, and Policy at Seton Hall University. His research interests include higher ed finance, accountability policies, and student financial aid, and he regularly teaches courses on the organization and governance of higher education and higher ed finance. He's the author of Higher Education Accountability, published by Johns Hopkins University Press, and has published ed articles in Economics of Education Review, Educational Evaluation and Policy Analysis, and the Journal of Higher Education. A graduate of Truman State University, Robert holds an MS in Economics and a PhD in Education Policy Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Finally, Andrew Kelly. He serves as the Senior Vice President for Strategy and Policy for the University of North Carolina system. He is charged with enhancing and furthering the UNC system's strategic goals and serves as a higher education policy expert to the President and the Board of Governors. Prior to joining the UNC system, Andrew was a resident scholar in education policy studies and the founding director of the Center on Higher Education Reform at AEI. A graduate of Dartmouth who earned a PhD in political science from Berkeley, Andrew has published work in academic journals and in popular outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. First, thank you, uh, three of you, for joining us today and uh, being so willing to share your thoughts. And before I ask uh, my questions of you all, I would just want to remind attendees that if you'd like to ask questions of your own, for, uh, of our panelists, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can do that anytime during our conversation. Um, I hope to spend the last 15 to 20 minutes asking questions that you all have. And if um, you notice any especially good questions on the Q&A screen, be sure to give those a thumbs up so I'm more likely to notice and ask them. All right, so let's, let's start with two very broad questions to establish how the three of you see the lay of the land. Um, and again, these, these are very broad questions. But uh, first, how much damage has the pandemic done to higher education in the United States? And secondly, and, and I'll, I'll phrase this very dramatically, will American higher ever education ever be the same? Uh, Naomi, do you wanna kick off? Sure. Um, thanks very much, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. Um, I guess I would I would start with a more dramatic question. For some colleges, you know, there is no going back. I, you've already seen uh, some colleges shut down their operations. The, the folks I've talked to in the field estimate that probably between 500 and 1,000 colleges are going to end up closing uh, as a result of this. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of those schools were already on the brink of, uh, you know, with great financial difficulty, and this is just 
you know, push them over the edge. Um, you know, certainly the fact that you saw kind of a, um, a you know, increasingly smaller uh, freshman classes just because of demographics, uh, you know, was going to influence that over the next few years. But again, I think the pandemic has definitely, um, you know, pushed them to the to the point of financial ruin. Um, I think the 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 question about um, kind of you know how this has has affected them most broadly, uh, you know, the ones that are going to stay in business, I think. Um, you know, people are going to be thinking about their higher education decisions differently, uh, parents and students. Obviously, they have less money. Everyone is going to have less money. They're, they've seen their uh, college savings funds, if they ever had them. Um, the, the value of those have, has plummeted significantly. I, I haven't wanted to look at ours. Um, uh, I think a lot of uh, families, you know, will, are going to need those, uh, those young people to, you know, to not spend that money and to, to go straight into the workforce if that's possible. Um, and, and then, you know, I think a lot of parents are going to be sort of looking very much at you know, some of the model of higher education, which is, um, I, I hesitate to say this, but a little bit as a, you know, kind of four year vacation uh, for some students, uh, that that's not going to work for them. They are going to want to see, uh, you know, students be spending a lot more time, um, you know, a lot less time in college that is sort of to get through faster um, and to, uh, to show that they're getting um, maybe more bang for their buck. So I, I think that's sort of broadly speaking where, where I think, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're headed currently. Andrew, how about you? Sure. Thank, thanks, Chris. And thanks for um, having me back, I guess, figuratively back at AI. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's always good to be, to be back. Spent a lot of great years there and, um, and I'm appreciative still for the work that you all do. So thank you for having me. Um, I, I largely agree with, with um, most of what Naomi said. I think, um, I think closures and consolidations in the case of public institutions are likely on the, on the uh, agenda. Um, states, states like ours that are growing and have a growing economy, I think will be um, in better shape than those that have been shrinking population wise and have significant pension liabilities as far as their public, sec their public um, sector institutions. So they'll probably be a lot more, um, have to be a lot more active on that question of consolidation or merger, um, which we've seen in other places. I also agree really that the pandemic isn't necessarily causing, uh, it's causing the, the timing of the closure, not necessarily the eventual closure. Um, and by that, I mean, um, you know, as Naomi pointed out, demographic trends are such that higher ed is going to go from having you know, really a bumper crop of traditional age students year after year after year um, due to population growth. And by that, I mean students between the ages of 18 to 24 to a period um, of at least a plateau, uh, at best a plateau, and at worst in many places, a decline in the number of those students. Um, and, you know, the, the, the point is what, what happens when you have an industry that is used to a, a consistent supply of its clientele well, you, you expand and you take and you go to great scale and you build. Um, and um, so a lot of these places were, were already fundamentally um, in trouble. Their fundamentals weren't great. Um, and I think this will accelerate that and kind of lay bare more of what was already becoming apparent. Um, how much damage has been done sort of outside of that group of schools that's kind of been on the, the, the sort of margin for, for, for the last few years? I think it depends on how much longer this goes, honestly. I think, um, I think what we've seen is that the, the traditional college business model, which consists obviously not only of tuition and fees, but also of, of these other um, elements like auxiliary enterprises, right? So dorms and dining and athletics, and in some cases, uh, clinical health services. You know, it's rare that an industry sees a source of revenue go to zero in the space of a, of a couple hours. And that's really what happened, right, with, with auxiliaries in particular. Students were ordered out of dorms, refunds were made, the decision was made to keep um, uh, school online for the summer. That, that's money that you would normally count on as a CFO, um, having the ability to spend the proceeds from those um, from, from housing and dining and other things, um, that turned off automat that turned off in a, in a, in a overnight. And so the question really is if it, if, if remote instruction stretches into the fall and, and those revenue sources are, uh, continue to see challenges, um, 
I think that will have, uh, it already has had and will have significant implications for what we think of when we think of the traditional college experience. Um, so I, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, yeah. I'm sure Robert has a lot to say as well. Well, I don't have as much to say because I'm, I'm answering this question last, but <laughs> as, right. no, that's fine. As of right now, the damage has been limited as of May 27th, but the uncertainty here is crucial. When colleges are announcing that, when they announce in July that they'll be mostly, if not fully online in the fall, that's when I would expect to see maybe a few dozen small private colleges closing. I don't think it's going to be hundreds or a thousand. That would be almost the entire small private nonprofit sector. But it'll take several years of closures and put them into several weeks. And then those colleges will really struggle going forward. Now, if there's a bright side out of all this is once it's safe to go back out in person and we're still in a recession, enrollment tends to go up in higher ed. That helps. That helps to get revenue sources for colleges. And in terms of will higher ed ever be the same? I think there, there will be strong demand for the residential model just because I think people realize what they're missing and they're also getting a less than ideal version of online education. And some of them may have chosen a better version, but sitting through hours of Zoom lectures isn't the best way to deliver it, even though that's what we had to do. So that may give traditional education a boost, as well as helping some colleges develop their capacity for hybrid and online classes to better serve students. When, when you say that um, the residential model will, will uh, have a strong demand, you, you said that it's because people realize what they're missing. What, what do you think they are missing from the residential model? Is it, is it just the in-person classes or is there more to it? I, I think they, they will be missing an in-person experience after being mm -hmm. cooped up with their family for an extended period of time. I, I don't know what you mean. It's, it's been <laughs> cooped up. What, what are you talking about? Um, all right. Well, do, thank you all. Chris, I'll just chime in on that. I, I, think yeah. Robert, I think Robert's right about that. I think, I think a couple things. One is that there's a, there's a popular narrative that this is going to change uh, student preferences dramatically in favor mm -hmm. of the online model. I don't think we see almost any evidence of that in the data that's been collected thus far. Yeah. Most of the data that's been collected is imperfect. But, and the only other thing I would say is I do think that there's a chance that this has drawn a lot of attention to not just tuition, but to, to get a little wonky for a second, but to the fees that you pay for specific campus services, student mm -hmm. health, student activities, recreation, athletics is a fee often. I think that there will, I think, there will be a shift in how people think about those fees because right now they're sold as a bundle, right? You can't, you can't just, they're mandatory in most places. You can't just pick the student health fee and the recreation fee. You have to pay all of them. I think that this is going to drive some pressure on the demand side for, for, for more a la, carte, a la carte pricing of those things because people will simultaneously become uh, more sort of wedded to that in-person experience, but less excited about paying for any particular one piece of it that they might not use as a student. I, I just wanted to add one other thing in terms of the money coming in too. You're also gonna see a big drop, I think, with the recession in alumni donations. And I think a lot of college colleges are very worried about fundraising now, um, aside from everything else. Uh, Naomi, you, you recently wrote uh, quote, now is the time for colleges to return to their core mission of education and they should pull out all the stops. Can you elaborate on that? What, what, um, what, what core mission in particular did you have in mind there? What, what specific reforms were you thinking of? So, I, you know, I look at the, the families uh, around uh, my neighborhood because, you know, I'm out walking every day. Mm -hmm over and over. Uh, and it's interesting because what I see is that, um, you know, the, the K-12 schools around here are making a valiant effort. And I think that a lot of those kids are, are pretty occupied. What's interesting is that I think that 
the college students actually seem less occupied than their younger siblings who are in high school. Um, and the fact that they're now living in the same household now has kind of brought this uh, into stark relief for a lot of families. I mean, the, you know, the average number of hours that kids are spending in college, uh, in classroom and, uh, you know, and doing uh, work um, has been declining uh, for the last few decades. Uh, and I think that if colleges really wanted to make a statement, I would encourage them to ask students to increase their course load this fall, um, particularly if they're going to stay online, uh, to make sure that uh, that students, you know, are uh, as occupied as they can be. Um, uh, you know, if uh, it's a little late for this now, but if I were colleges, I would certainly be encouraging students to enroll in more summer uh, online classes now that internships have been canceled and jobs have been canceled. Um, you know, this is really the time to get a lot of those course credits under your belt um, and to move yourself toward graduation faster. Uh, and I think that there are reforms, you know, things that not only colleges can do, but, you know, our, I think our financial aid system is problematic for not, you know, not paying, uh, you know, for, uh, for more, um, uh, not reimbursing students for more of the summer courses that they might take. Um, so I, I would really encourage colleges just to think, especially if they're going to stay online, uh, to, to move toward allowing uh, students to, to take more courses and to, um, to really, uh, you know, get more of those, those credits done. Um, but just in terms of generally speaking, the, the core mission, I think uh, a lot of students who are seniors now or who are juniors who are looking at colleges, um, yes, you should definitely talk to them about the importance of what that in-person uh, experience has and has for them. And if you are going to open this fall, emphasize, you know, why that's so vital and, and what is the social capital that you get out of college? I mean, we've definitely, you know, I, as, as I, I certainly talk about, you know, some of this being, uh, you know, the, the partying and the waste of time, but I think, you know, the connections that you make in colleges they're going to definitely have to sell students on this. Um, I was talking to a friend at a, you know, who teaches at a flagship university, and she said, we have to open because essentially if we don't, uh, students can get credits, you know, at the non-flagship schools that can then be applied to our school for a degree, um, and, mm -hmm. and we will not get that money. And I think that that sort of, to me, emphasized what, you know, what the issue is here. They have to show um, what their value added is uh, at a, as a more expensive flagship school or if you're a private school, um, what are you doing for students that they couldn't get, you know, at their local community college, for instance? Um, just to follow up on that quickly, uh, in, in our uh, second um, keynote session, Senator uh, Ben Sass said something along the lines of that the, the pandemic isn't um, pushing colleges towards any new reforms so much as, I guess, as Andrew was suggesting earlier, accelerating uh, some reforms that were kind of already uh, started very, very slowly, but have now been accelerated. Is that kind of how you see things too? Is that a helpful way of looking at, at the issue and what the pandemic's done? I'm not sure what, what kinds of reforms the Senator was referring to. I mean, I think a lot of colleges have been quite resistant uh, to this sort of thing. Some, some schools have definitely done it. I mean, you've definitely mm -hmm. seen, um, you know, Mitch Daniels doing this at Purdue and some other schools have, have started to move toward, you know, can we get a three-year degree going? If students are going to stay four years, can they at least get a double major out of it or something like that? And, um, you know, I think a few schools have done that, but I think a lot of schools have, have remained very much, you know, kind of digging their heels into the, to the current model. And, and that's why this is accelerating, uh, you know, their demise for some of them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Robert, uh, Seton Hall announced, I think last week, that it would have a condensed semester uh, in the fall with students not returning to campus after Thanksgiving break and taking their, their finals online. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the logic behind that calendar, um, as well as some of the obstacles you see it presenting? And I should add that I think Seton Hall is not alone in that calendar, right? A number of other yes. schools are doing something similar. Yeah, I, I think the announcement was influenced that Notre Dame announced it yeah. a few days prior, and now Michigan State just announced the same thing in the last hour. Colleges like following each other for safety. And once a few do it, everyone will try to do it. But the, the logic is that by not bringing people back in person after Thanksgiving, they'll try to avoid the worst of winter and the virus and having people go home and then come back which works well if you're a residential liberal arts college 
with a community with no people surrounding. If you're a commuter institution or a place where even a lot of faculty and staff are just in the area around others, it's hard to think about that really reducing transmission of the virus. But one thing that really hit colleges hard in the spring was spreading over spring break, coming back for two or three days, and then sending everyone right back home. Thank you. Uh, and Andrew, um, well, actually, let, Robert, let me follow up a little yeah. bit on that. Um, so what, what are the conditions, uh, like testing conditions and things like that, um, uh, going to be at Seton Hall? Do they have a, does their policy yet address anything along those lines? Uh, they want to do testing. They have mm -hmm. committees formed about it, but there are unresolved issues about how often will testing be, yeah. how expensive will it be, how many people can fit in a classroom, just the logistics of getting things to work. Those are all unclear basically everywhere across the country. And colleges are grappling with the potential price tag of opening up in person versus the potential price tag of opening up online and losing that on-campus revenue. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, Andrew, I want to talk to you uh, from your, ask you questions based on your perspective as an executive who oversees the policies of a, of a large state system. Um, how do you, how are you all trying to balance the very different concerns of the different kinds of uh, schools in your state? So uh, like, do you see a uniform response from the schools within the system or the needs of say, um, UNC Asheville um, going to differ substantially from those of Chapel Hill. And given those differences, if there are any, I mean, how do you, how do you address those as an, as an executive in the UNC system? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It runs, through, it runs through everything we do, not just pandemic response, as you'd imagine. Mm -hmm. For those who, who may not be as familiar with it, the UNC system is a system of 16 public four-year universities uh, in the state, all the public universities in the state are under our umbrella, as well as a School of Science and Math, which is a magnet high school, residential magnet high school for science and math in Durham, um, just around the corner from here where I am in Chapel Hill. We have everything in that list of schools from, from Carolina, UNC Chapel Hill, which is the flagship with medical school, NC State, which is a land grant flagship uh, in, in, in its own right with engineering, world-renowned engineering programs to five HBCUs. We have an arts conservatory, we have UNC Asheville, which is a public liberal arts college. So we really have kind of a lot of different institutions all under one umbrella. So Chris, your question is, is incredibly important uh, on, uh, on this. What I would say is that here's some of the dynamic that we've seen. Um, institutions are, are um, they're different not only in their mission, they're also different in where they're located. Um, and, and their location has a lot to do with how the pandemic is affecting them and how they need to, how they need to plan for the fall. So to give you a couple examples, you've got, you've got institution, research institutions in our system like, like uh, UNC Chapel Hill or ECU, which also has a medical school, um, other places that have significant uh, uh, you know, scientific research capacity. They're, they're better equipped in some senses to do some of the testing and tracing and, and response to this. Whereas, you know, Western Carolina, which is out in the very far western part of the state, it's closer to five state capitals other than Raleigh. That's how far west it is. Um, western has a, a real challenge on their hands because if they're going to have to rely only on state and local uh, or, you know, health, local health departments, it's going to be a challenge for them to get some of that infrastructure that Robert was describing sort of in play and ready to go. It's also going to strain some of the town gown relationships, right? Because because we have Chapel Hills, a sizable town, Greensboro is a big town, Raleigh's a big town, but you know even places like Greenville, where ECU is, or Cullowhee, where um, where Western Carolina is, some of the local authorities may be less than keen about the dynamic that Robert's talking about, where you're bringing a whole lot of folks from different corners of the state back um, back to the system. So, what I would say is where we've seen. Uh, some our institutions have in some cases requested from the system office guidance so that they can feel comfortable making the decisions that need to be made right so they they, they need the system office to say this is what we're going to do across the system such that there's not a whole lot of variation in part because you don't want one school to be doing one thing and another school to be doing a different thing a lot of families have have two kids one at one place and one at the other 
right? So they might ask, why is it, why is it so different here? Why are they testing everybody here, but not, but only testing symptomatic people here? So there's been an effort to, to sort of put together a framework that provides enough guidance under which those 16 institutions in the high school can do what they, what they wish um, within, that, within those parameters. The last thing I would say just quickly about, you know, to Naomi's point about calendar flexibility and kind of using the summer more judiciously, it's something that we've been working on for, for, for a couple of years now, even before this. And I think one of the biggest things that you'll see after this pandemic is a lot more creative thinking about academic calendars. Um, I, think, I think this notion of the tr traditional 16 week semester, I think we're gonna do things a lot differently, almost out of necessity to prepare for a recurrence, for instance. So ECU and UNC Asheville, they're gonna do the fall in two eight week blocks, right? So if you have a recurrence in the middle of the, of the semester, then the students have at least banked those credits, if you will, then they could go home and earn the others remotely for that second eight week block. Um, from there, it's not that big a leap to see cut sort of a continuous set of eight week blocks that runs all the way up through the calendar year and students can take the credits when they need to. And in some cases, it dramatically accelerate their progress toward a degree by using that time more efficiently. Although I would add one caveat to that. Faculty contracts aren't always the most amenable to summer courses because right. many of us aren't paid to work June, July, August. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then that, you that, might also see some, uh, you know, some more creative thinking about just building use. I mean, you know, the the idea mm -hmm. that classes only happen until you know two o'clock Monday through Thursday on some of these campuses. I think, especially if you mm -hmm. want to, um, you know, have uh, you know more social distance between people, you may have to, you know, expand the, the number of hours that you're using the buildings and the number of buildings on campus that you're using. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, before I ask a, another question, I just want to remind all the attendees that if you have any questions you would like to ask our uh, panelists, please use the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to ask the question. And in about 10 minutes, I'll start getting to those questions and, uh, and ask on your behalf. Uh, also, if you see any questions already posted in that Q&A function that you especially like, um, give it a thumbs up so I'll be sure to notice it and be more likely to ask. So, um, Robert, you just mentioned um, faculty pay. Uh, so I am curious a little bit about, um, you know, most uh, about how all of this is going to affect faculty. Generally, we, we discuss um, how the pandemic is in fact, uh, affecting the institutions very broadly or the students specifically and less often about faculty themselves. So um, what are some of the bigger consequences you see open this up to everybody, but start with Robert. Um, what do you see coming down the, the pike for uh, repercussions for the role of faculty, the pay, payment of faculty and, the, and administrations in the future? Are we gonna see um, bigger teaching loads, larger classes, or are we gonna see the opposite? Um, are we gonna see these hiring freezes and pay freezes go on interminably? Um, what, what do you expect down the road? I think the biggest long-term change is that higher ed will be very hesitant to commit to long-term expenses. And that goes beyond faculty to where st even starting new programs, building new buildings, that will get second guessed. But things like faculty tenure will be increasingly hard to defend because they, I think they're going to have a hard time getting senior faculty to retire during the middle of a recession and that makes it very hard to hire people to replace. Mm -hmm. I think we're moving toward short to medium term contracts. And then it's the issue also of shared governance who controls the curriculum when you have a lot of these crises happening during the summer and you have faculty who are generally not on contract. So this could accelerate some substantial changes in higher ed about a 12 month administration versus a nine month faculty. Mm -hmm. So when, when, you, when you say uh, short to medium term contracts, you mean something basically between adjuncts and tenure? Is that what you have in mind? I, I'm, I would expect something between, say, a, a three to five year contract for people yeah. who have been there a while. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Naomi, what do, what do you think? Well, it, it, one question is whether any universities are going to use this uh, to address the administrative bloat question. I mean, it, it is true that I, I think you're going to see some 
uh, uh, some cutting back of, of, of tenured positions. And it's definitely true that older faculty are going to be less likely to retire uh, once they look at their 401ks. Um, but I, I think uh, a lot of there's going to be pressure on universities. Uh, one way you'll see this is through, as Andrew was saying, the consolidation of some of these larger universities. There's going to be a lot of uh, administrative overlap and there will be pressure on these schools to say, like, do we really need, you know, this number, half dozen administrators who seem to be doing the same thing? Um, so, you know, that from my perspective, could be one positive effect mm -hmm. of this. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe a, a lot of faculty would, would see that as a, as a positive development too. That, that could definitely also change the balance of power if you see uh, less in the way of, of new administrative hires and, uh, and the kind of departments of administrative departments that, that have actually tended to try to, to control the curriculum over time. I, I would say, it, um, just to jump in on that, I think one of the more interesting things, it's a, it's a little bit less of a long-term question and more of a short-term question, but it's gonna be very interesting to watch how institutions deal with faculty who are, who are considered based on their age in a vulnerable population for, mm -hmm. and how are they gonna react when those individuals say, look, I don't feel safe teaching in person um, in a large classroom. Um, I either need to teach online or I need some modification to my teaching load to address this. I think you're going to see a lot of those questions arise on, um, uh, you know, both in faculty senate discussions, which I'm sure Robert's very familiar with, but also, um, you know, in terms of governing boards and governing bodies having to think through the policy that will be in place to address, address that challenge. Um, so that's, that's one, one thing I would flag. Um, and then the other thing that I would point out quickly is, um, you know, to the extent that institutions are going to have to plan for a recurrence in the fall, and that part of that might be doing classes that are offered both face-to-face -face and online, that's going to be a, an added uh, amount of work for faculty. And mm -hmm. so, um, so there's going to be, you know, there will obviously be a discussion, um, a discussion about what that means for compensation and other things at the same time that, um, at the same time that state budgets, of course, are, are experiencing unprecedented uh, uh, budget deficits. So, you know, I think um, it's, well, it, it'll be interest, very interesting to watch in the near term how all that plays out. And that'll have implications for these long term dynamics, I think, as well. What, what you're all saying about um, tenure, the tenure situation and, and uh, faculty members being reluctant to retire, it sounds like that will also have kind of a trickle down effect on graduate students, um, students whether they want to go to grad school, but I'm also thinking about uh, people just getting their PhDs, going on to the job market, and job market is never, isn't very good in good economic times, in, in many disciplines anyway. This, I'm speaking as somebody who has an, an English degree, so, um, you know, the perennial call was, the market's getting better, but it never was really. Um, and this seems like that this could have serious ramifications for, for that getting much worse. I want to know who told you the market was getting better. Oh, the, you know, when you go on the, the visit to campus, they, <laughs> oh, okay. they, they, you know, people, misery loves company. So yeah. <laughs> they, they say that. So you go. Um, so that, that's very interesting though. I mean, I, obviously the, the point about tenure and the point about administrative bloat it, those two reforms have been kind of, again, perennial concerns for uh, conservative reformers of higher education. Um, so it would be, be interesting to see how that does play out. But I imagine administrative bloat, um, a lot of that relies on kind of, a lot of that is a response to federal regulations, isn't it? So um, for that to really scale down, uh, there are, it, to a degree, it has to come from um, federal deregulation. Is, is that right? I mean, uh, does that sound right? Or, or is there, do you think the financial imperative would be enough for the colleges? Like for, for, for example, like Title IX offices, that those are as large as they are in large part because of federal regulations about Title IX. So schools aren't gonna, aren't gonna take funding away from that unless federal regulations on those issues are, are lightened. I think that's probably true. I mean, there, 
I, I wouldn't say that it's uh, the administrative bloat has come entirely from the, the regulations that have been imposed on colleges. I mean, some of it definitely, but a lot of it is um, sort of student life, broadly speaking, uh, mm -hmm. and the attempts by colleges to sort of um, make student life more interesting or more exciting or more, um, you know, uh, political in some ways, um, and, and not just uh, coming from the regulations. But I do think, uh, if you don't mind me sort of taking it sideways for a minute, I think the, the, the regulation question and the legal questions um, uh, are going to be, you know, plaguing a lot of colleges and, and the, the question of uh, what, you know, what they're going to be liable for, uh, you know, and, and, you know, how, how faculty uh, may hold them responsible, older faculty may hold them responsible for, you know, sickness or outbreaks and, and, and the same thing with students and parents. Uh, and that is the kind of, uh, you know, of regulation that, you know, you're, I think you're going to see, um, they're going to have to institute, you know, uh, COVID-19 administrators to be measuring all of the risk um, that they're taking with with each possible step. So that that's where I would see actually mm. more of this, uh, you know, uh, going forward. Yeah. And another piece of this is what is in a faculty workload versus a staff member or administrator. An example, of this would be academic advising, where mm -hmm. that used to be much more under the faculty purview. But then people realized that faculty were generally terrible at it. <laughs> and faculty are expensive. So there's an argument to make it make sense to give it to someone else. But when you have budget cuts, does it make sense to say faculty should be evaluated more on this type of service than on research? But can faculty on the tenure track believe that they'll be evaluated fairly on service or do they think that research is really what matters? So it's again another issue of what are the incentives facing individual faculty members? Yeah, I, I think just you know, to, to step back for a second from this, I think that the news that we're hearing about state budgets and the cuts that will come with those state budgets, um, and possibly not this fiscal year, but possibly next fiscal year because of the lag, some lag time, you know, I think in, universities are going to have to get a handle on, on uh, human capital and HR and how they spend very, very scarce resources. And some of them are going to go and they're going to go in different directions, right? So some have very little fat at the administrative level to cut. They've done, they've, they've already, they've already been, you know, they've already been there and done that. Now, Naomi might suggest that's the minority of schools, but, but those schools are going to have a different set of challenges to face, right? If they've already gone through, gone through some of that. Others, others may well have, have positions that need to be rethought um, on the, on the sort of non-academic side or the academic side, but on the administrative front. Um, and I do think that, it, that, you know, the administrative bloat conversation is, is almost certainly a both and when it comes to federal regulation and mm -hmm. university driven um, expansion. Um, it's, 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 bo it's both things and not all of it is created kind of in terms of uh, what's required by the feds. Not all of it is required, um, but it's also, a, it's also a risk management strategy, right? You have people who are available to help the institution manage its risk. Um, and that tends to be expensive, that risk, that risk profile is often generated by the things you're held responsible for by the feds. Yeah. All right, so we have time for uh, questions. We have a few questions from attendees. Um, first is from uh, Joseph Nippenberg. He, uh, he says this, let me state one possible characterization of your overall argument. Higher education will be even more corporatized and commodified, that is, less like genuine education. In other words, from the point of view of an old-fashioned liberal education, everything that is bad about current higher ed will be accelerated by the COVID crisis. Am I wrong about this, either as a characterization of your remarks or about the phenomenon in general? I can open to any of you guys. That's a, that's a, that's a big one. How much time do we have? <laughs> well, I mean, pick, picking it apart, uh, looking at it from the liberal arts angle is, is, uh, putting an element of that question another way. Uh, are liberal arts educations especially threatened here? Um, either because of, uh, for example, the move to online classes, if we see that as a possibility or the, uh, possibility of kind of, um, more career-oriented educations. Are I think that, that liberal arts, uh, 
yeah, I think that there will be some element uh, where uh, people will be looking just because of the economic uncertainty uh, for degrees that can be put to very immediate use uh, in earning money for themselves and their families. And I don't, um, I mean, you know, we can go back and forth all day, you know, trying to defend, and I've certainly defended, you know, the the things that people learn in a liberal arts degree. Um, but, you know, would would I advise, you know, somebody who's about to send their, you know, their kid off to, to college to, to not go into electrical engineering um, with the, the level of financial uncertainty that we're all experiencing right now? You know, probably not. Not. So, but I think that the question seems like it's this more broad question about just the, the commodification uh, of education. And I, I just think that, that that ship has sailed. I mean, I, I really think that the vast majority of, of both traditional and non-traditional students, um, you know, need to know uh, what the value of their of their college education is in financial terms. And, and some of those things are, are easily measured in financial terms, you know, with the particular uh, kind of job they can get afterwards. Some of them are a little bit more fuzzy, like the social capital that they get on a college campus. Um, but, but yes, I, I don't think we're turning back from the commodification and, and maybe we're going further down that road. I think um, I think I largely agree with that. You, you know, I think some of what's happened with it's kind of an interesting question, right? How do we define exactly what commodification is, right? Because on some level, you've actually seen like a, a an actual splintering of majors, right, into into very specific pre-professional type majors, right? So is that commodified in that like? a given school may have a, a very different set of program offerings than another. Is that really what a commodity is or is it, or is what we're actually talking about kind of the age old, is it liberal arts or is it kind of more geared toward, you know, sort of an occupation. Right. And to Naomi's point, I mean, some of this is as college has become more expensive students, especially those that are first generation who are petrified of how they're going to ever pay off the debt they're taking on to go. Feel a t I feel, I think, sort of pressure to enroll in a pre-professional major on the belief that mm -hmm. will allow them to pay those loans back. And I would suggest that we don't actually have great evidence that over the course of, say, your first 20 years of earning or first 40 years of your career, that, that the outcomes are all that different between those different types of programs. Um, so I think we've yeah. done ourselves a bit of a disservice. Mm -hmm. I, um, and I'm a graduate of liberal arts undergraduate experience and was well served by it. I think we've done ourselves a disservice by kind of making, making, making it out to be that those pre-professional programs are, are kind of much more lucrative, let's mm -hmm. say, long-term than a liberal arts degree. Yeah. The last, the last time I looked at the research, it's the, the difference is really in the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that, it starts to even out quite a bit. That's right. Robert, did you have anything to add to this? I, I would say that the, the governance structure is likely to become more corporate out of this because colleges mm -hmm. have to move very quickly and there's a growth in bringing in outside consultants to move things quickly as well. Mm -hmm. um, Charles North uh, asks about uh, safety liability avoidance. He, he points out that administrators are currently torn between safety slash liability avoidance by moving classes online keeping students at home, and financial troubles, uh, students taking a gap year or gap semesters, loss of auxiliary services revenue, as we discussed. Um, how do you think they should balance these concerns over the next academic year in particular? Andrew, do you want to kick that one off for us? This um, is an that's, easy one. That's the, hundred, that's, the, <laughs> yeah. that's the hundreds of billion dollars question, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, so, so I would, I would say one, one of the, so let me answer it by making an observation. One of the more interesting things that I think we've seen is that some of the institutions that are the least reliant on some of those other sources of revenue, um, auxiliaries that are de so dependent on in-person experience are planning on remaining online. So community, a lot of community colleges are planning on remaining online in the fall. Um, and, I, and I think part of that is because there's not as much of a thumb on the scale uh, on the financials to open up in person. Um, whereas other places that are selling a traditional residential experience, they're, they're sweating bullets about their ability to offer that and, and make sure that those revenues come in. So 
I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer um, about what the right way to go about it is, but, but I would just, I would point that out. Um, the, the only other thing I would say is that this to me is really the, it's the crux of the whole discussion and, and colleges have to worry about the, their public stature and the goodwill in which they're with, in which they're viewed. And I granted that's become a, that's become a more partisan issue of late, but generally college and universities are, are seen as, um, you know, uh, um, institutions that people take pride in and have faith in and so, and confidence in and so forth. Um, I think, I think they, we all need to consider as an industry, um, you know, how this decision could affect um, that goodwill. Um, and I think of it a little bit like the econ- like the debates we're having about the economy, about reopening mm-hmm. versus waiting a little bit longer, that if you were open too soon, it'd be worse for the economy, right? So I think there, there, some of the dynamic here is similar, right? If we, if we were to reopen, say, I think if we were to reopen for the summer, I think that would be too soon. And I think it would have, um, and I think it would backfire in that you'd probably have, you know, worse outcomes and a, and, a, and a bigger reputational hit than if you were more patient and waited till uh, the fall or in some cases the winter. Um, um, I think our, just the last thing I'll say is I think our institutions are, are approaching this with an abundance of caution and, and paying attention to the facts and, and doing a really good job of balancing the tension you pointed out. I was just going to say, I think the reputational hit is a, is a huge factor here. I mean, uh, you know, there's kind of a microcosm of this. If you watched, if any of you watched kind of the debate over summer camps opening, um, you know, a lot of camps, you know, waited until the last possible minute uh, about canceling. But, but many of the camps just made the decision that, you know, if we open and something goes wrong, uh, you know, we're, we're doomed for next summer and the summer after that. And, you know, we have these parents who are trusting us with their kids. And so, you know, even if it, it's going to be a huge financial hit to us, if we want to exist, you know, for the foreseeable future, we have to be thinking about next summer too. Mm-hmm. Um, Mitch Daniels the other day wrote something, I think, in the Washington Post saying that uh, it would be a disservice. Of, I think he maybe even said a moral disservice to his students if, if Purdue didn't open um, in the fall. Uh, is he putting himself in position of possibly getting in trouble, taking a reputational hit himself, making a statement like that, going out on the ledge like that? Or do you think that's kind of the – do you think um, – parents and students are looking for a strong affirmation like that. I, I think students who are paying full price are looking for that sort of affirmation mm-hmm. and he can always get out of it by saying public health conditions changed. Yeah. But that's why colleges are being strong about opening in person when in reality, most classes in the fall will be online. I would just add to that. I, th- I think, um, you know, I, I think that, that the, the biggest thing that families seem to be seeking is a sense of safety and security about coming back. And so a lot of it's going to be how do colleges signal to their clientele that they are taking this uh, as seriously as, as, as any other organization. And the only other thing I'd say is we don't know, we don't often don't know the counterfactual of what, where would the student be if they weren't on a college campus. Mm-hmm argument for having them on a college campus where you have entire teams of people who are thinking about how to keep them healthy, as opposed to scattered out in wherever they are in the country or in the state that they live in. And that's not going to be the case, right? They may not be in a place that has, um, that has as, uh, as, as strong a set of public health protocols to protect the health and safety of community members. So I, I do think that and I don't know necessarily where President Daniels was going as far as his kind of motivation for making that statement, but that's one way to read it is actually these students might be safer here than wherever they would be. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he based his, his argument in large part on the fact that uh, college age students are not the ones most at danger in this situation. So that, mm-hmm. uh, that's a big reason behind it. Um, Andrew, we have a question about state budgets here that you might be uh, best able to address. Uh, mm-hmm. Jeffrey Vaughn points out that state budgets were, uh, have been under unprecedented stress, not only recovering from the current lockdown, but also from the pension crisis. Um, w- what does that mean uh, for moving ahead with uh, exactly how much states can fund higher education in the future? Can they afford to 
fund them at, at the current levels a after this uh, crisis? Well, I think, you know, what we've seen in the past is higher ed tends to be one of the balance wheels, if not the primary balance wheel for state budgets. You know, states have to balance their budget. So when you have a significant shortfall, what's the first thing you look for? Well, you look for state concerns that actually have other revenue sources. And higher ed's at the top of that list because we can raise money from tuition and research and auxiliaries and other things. And so I think almost certainly higher ed will be asked to uh, slash required to uh, mm -hmm. take take on um, some of that budget, uh, some of the budget deficit, um, some of the budget reduction that we're seeing, we're gonna see statewide in other, in other places and in, and in North Carolina. I think the question is then, where does it go from there? Um, some states have, um, have dramatically reduced their funding of their institutions to the point where their institutions are really kind of state affiliated at this point, not necessarily state run. Um, and the question I think is for those that have not quite gotten that far yet, Will they ever, will they go that same route and ever return to a, a point where they're state run? North Carolina, we're very different. We're, we're, you know, in the top five in terms of per pupil appropriation. It's in our constitution to keep the education as free as practicable. I, I think we will be, we will face cuts, but, but we will not be in that category of states that, that is, I don't think there's any chance that we'll be in that category of states that dramatic, so dramatically reduces their funding that it will be state affiliated. But, um, but, you know, Rob, Robert's looked at this in detail, too, and, and I, think, I think we'll see more of that. And the question is, what happens during a recovery is the more interesting question. And several states already, they went back and made cuts on this fiscal year. That's right. And in, in New Jersey, they said, we're in such bad shape, we're extending the fiscal year by three months so we can figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. So some states, it's going to be years to recover. I think you also might see some interesting um, pressures on the balance of in-state versus out-of-state students. Uh, a lot of students are going to be wanting, even if they are willing to go to a residential school, are going to want to stay closer to home. Um, and of course, you know, uh, with their own budgets pressed at home, they're going to want to find a lower tuition option. Um, I've, I've certainly heard from, uh, you know, state university folks who say, you know, they were already busting at the seams and their applications um, are going through the roof uh, from all the people who want to uh, stay in state. And so a lot of states that have become dependent on the higher tuition rates that they can charge for out of state students are going to have to balance the money that they're getting from them against the pressures of their own residents to want spots at those schools. Um, Oh, sorry, Andrew, did I cut you off? No, I just said that's a great point. I agree. Um, Charles North wants to push back a little bit about what we were saying regarding administrative bloat. Uh, he says he's speaking from a uh, standpoint of somebody at a private university. He's at Baylor. Um, he's, he explains that a lot seems to come from provision of student life services because that is the margin where Baylor competes with other universities. So in that, seeing it that way, is it really bloat, um, if, especially if it is part of providing distinctive services that students and families value bundled with college? And so is it, that's his question. And I'll add to that, are we going to see even um, a paring down of that, whether you call it bloat or not, but those, that student service oriented uh, approach of schools like Baylor? Are we going to get to more of like a back to basics approach from even, you know, large schools like that. Yeah, I, I think he's spot on that if, if some colleges go away from providing these amenities, they run the risk and research shows of losing what, what are called low ability, high income students, the ones who pay full price. Mm -hmm. And that's potentially devastating. And there are plenty of colleges out there that have gone the model of relatively low frills. But for the ones, especially residential colleges, it's hard to get rid of those services without losing the students who are paying the bills. Yeah, I think so. One thing I would say, you know, about the frills versus no frills is I do think that there's there's also going to be there's going to be some market correction here as well. So a lot of the pro not necessarily on the staffing side. So to to Dr. North, Mr. North's question, not necessarily talking about the staffing side of the administrative float piece, but in terms of capital and, and facilities and, and building out the student service infrastructure, 
a lot of those projects are debt are debt service, right? They're debt they're debt financed, and then you pay down the debt service with a student fee or a user fee, right, um, of some kind. I wonder. One of the things I wonder out of this is are how are lenders going to bake the price of a possible pandemic into their into their interest rate mm-hmm. there, right, going forward? And is that going to actually whether an institution wants to build the lazy river or the climbing wall or not, to use the kind of trite examples, mm-hmm. right? Um, whether they want to build them or not, is is the cost of borrowing to pay for those things going to be so prohibitively expensive they can't do it? Um, they can't afford it. Um, and that's just going to be something to watch because again, back to this conversation about if you send everybody home and nobody's paying those fees because they're learning online because of a recurrence, you can't pay your debt service on those things suddenly as an institution. Um, so that'd yeah. be interesting to watch. Naomi, do you have anything to add to, to that question or that line of discussion? No, look, I mean, I I think that uh, Robert's right that, you know, the schools that offer these, um, uh, you know, bells and whistles definitely end up getting the the full, uh, the full paying tuition folks, I guess it just seems like there's going to be less of those folks to go around, um, which sort of Mm -hmm. gets you back to this question of which institution, whether, whether all the institutions are going to remain competing on that level, or whether some are going to try to distinguish themselves by saying, no, we really understand the financial situations of our students and our families and as a result we've decided to cut back on lazy river um, and and we're going to cut back on student fees and uh, and we're going to come back on some of the administration that supports all those things yeah. well wonderful um, that's about all the time we have for today for the for the last session um, I want to thank Robert Naomi and Andrew for joining us on this final panel and sharing your thoughts about about these issues and the future of uh, higher ed reform, given the pandemic, uh, a lot of a lot to chew on here and a lot to consider um, in in the weeks and months and probably years ahead. So thank you very much, and thank you all uh, for attending all of today's events. Um, really appreciate your participation and your time, and I uh, hope we've given you a lot to think about and appreciate all of the questions you asked. Uh, please stay tuned for more events like this in the in the months ahead. Uh, AEI's academic programs hopes to keep reaching out to our uh, faculty uh, members and ad- members of admi- administrations in our network for more events like this. So thank you very much for spending the day with us and uh, wish you a great summer. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.